Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 to 9. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord and not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you that we have the freedom to gather here together. Lord, we pray that you would bless this time in your word. Thank you for all the children that you have brought to this body of believers. Thank you for those that are leading them today. And I pray that you give them a great uh, time with uh, their children, that they're, they're, they get the privilege of investing their lives in. Thank you for the nursery as well and all who serve in this body. Lord, we pray that you, through your word and through your spirit, you speak to our hearts about serving wherever you've placed us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One other announcement, if you see the bulletin, the insert there talks about a dinner at the main campus in Richland for uh, veterans. That's uh, a free dinner for veterans to say you thank you to you and to say whether you're currently serving or have served. And if you would like to take somebody, you just need to fill that out or call the main campus and let them know that um, you're going to be participating in that uh, dinner. Um, we spent the last few weeks talking about being a servant. And last week, we spent a lot of time stressing the fact that being a servant must begin in the home. Husbands are to serve their wives. Wives are to serve their husbands. Parents are to serve the children. And children, in turn, are to serve their parents. The idea of serving one another, it's summed up in Ephesians chapter 5. And just remember this. These verses are all added after the, these letters were written, the, the book of Ephesians is a letter written to a body of believers in the city of Ephesus. So it was a letter. And you can read verse 21 where it sums up the idea of serving where it says, Paul says to the Christian, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Serve one another. Defer to one another out of reverence or love for Jesus Christ. Let me share an interesting thought with you about servants. Now think about it. Servants don't advertise. Rarely, if ever, you will, will you see someone with a sign saying, quiet, servant at work. Most people don't put servant on their resume or on their business card because it's not necessarily popular to promote yourself as being a servant. The fact is, you most likely don't even notice that servants are around you until one day those servants are gone. And suddenly, in the office, you can't find that important file. You don't have a clue where it is. Or there's no one there to make you coffee. Or no one to water the plants. Or no one who remembers the birthdays. No one who is available to do all those little things that you took for granted until that servant was gone. Often, you don't realize what a blessing you had in that servant and what they were a blessing in your life until they're no longer present until they're no longer available. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 22, verse 27, Jesus makes a very powerful statement. He's telling His disciples in the upper room in Jerusalem, He said, I am among you. I'm here in your midst as one who serves. Now, think of the men that Jesus was speaking those words to. He was saying, I'm a servant. I'm among you. I'm in your midst as one who serves. He was saying those words to pride-filled disciples who had been having an ongoing and a quite animated discussion among themselves about who was the greatest. They were all debating, like Muhammad Ali, who's the greatest? I'm the greatest. My prayerful goal in this series is to enable us to desire to have a, a spirit, a servant's heart, a servant's spirit here at West Hills. Servants are unusual people. You find them in unusual places. Servants are willing to perform all kinds of unique and unlikely tasks. And the plain and simple truth is this. If you are going to be a Christ-honoring servant, it's much more than just a Sunday morning happening. As I said earlier, servanthood actually begins in the home. How many of you know who Nellie Cable is? 
That's what I thought. Other than having a famous granddaughter, little was known of Nellie by the general population. I had the privilege of knowing her for 10 years. She was a stay-at-home mom. She served her family, her husband, her three sons and a daughter. Nellie loved to cook. And she would host family meals every Sunday after church. And she would have these unbelievable meals for 10 to 20 people. But she made enough food for 20 to 40 people. I used to say, Nellie, where's the rest of the people that you cooked for? Nellie also liked to make uh, quilts and donated them to people as a demonstration of her love for them. Nellie even opened up her own home to a boarder with no family in the Johnstown area. She worked quietly behind the scenes serving a lot of people. Who's Nellie's famous granddaughter? My lovely wife, Sandy. Nellie played a major role in Sandy's formative years, showing her unconditional love and modeling a servant's heart to her family and to the church and to those outside of the church as well. Also, when I was thinking about servants that I've known, I thought of Bill Carball. His legal name, I knew him as Bill, but his legal name was Clarence William Carball. He was a genuine servant. He helped me out with a lot of projects around the house and, and the church that I formerly had the privilege of pastoring. And if you know me, I'm not good with tools at all. I don't need a toolbox or tool belt because I wouldn't know what to do with it. But I had Bill, and he was a great help. And when something needed fixed, something needed done, I just picked the phone up and I called Bill and said, Bill, can you help me? And the matter was taken care of, taken well care of, and almost immediately. When I moved on to Emmanuel, I really missed Bill and his wife, Eni. And I'm thankful now that Bill's uh, daughter and son-in-law come here to Emmanuel West, Ted and Char Voitko. I also think today, and I thank God for all the people who serve. We were blessed this weekend to have a lot of people serving us. And I thought of two people who have demonstrated servants' hearts. Bob Schaefer, Carol Rezac, and they were at the early service. I've known Bob for over 10 years, and he's been used by the Lord to bless our family. Bob is a doer. He gets fidget if he has to stand around. He goes visiting with me, and if we sit in someone's house very long, Bob has to stand up and start moving. And anytime I mention a project that needs to be done, there's Bob to the rescue. When we moved into our current house, which next week, the Lord willing, will be our former house, Bob helped me plant the grass. He mulched our yard with us. And I, I have to say this, when Saint, we moved in there, Sandy said, I like our neighbor's uh, back setting there. You know, that little, it sets off the yards. And uh, I called and asked for low maintenance. Well, let me tell you, there are, I won't name the landscaper, but their idea of low maintenance is like 50 shrubs and a lot of mulch. And I'm like, let me see that guy. Let me call him and tell him I'm doing some low maintenance work. How about coming to help me? Because uh, I'm not skilled at trimming shrubs. And my neighbor's out there and he's got it perfect. He spends 10 hours on one tree. I'm like, I'm spending 10 hours on 50 shrubs, but low maintenance. But Bob was a big help to me. Bob also, ha- I had the privilege of serving alongside Bob when we went to uh, Gulfport, Mississippi in 2005 after Hurricane Katrina. Bob, I remember they were on an hour time difference. And it'd be like we were in a multi-purpose building. It'd be dark, and Bob, I could hear someone wrestling around over there in the, the big room. And I'd look up in the dark and see Bob. I'd go, Bob, lay back down. They're an hour difference. Nobody's awake yet. Lay back down. As soon as somebody got up, Bob popped up. He's a worker. Carol Rezac, she's been a great blessing to us. She would bring Sandy and I, when we moved into our office over there, a snack bag each week as we began our full-time ministry. She said, we're just so glad you're here. We want to be an encouragement to you. Now she takes care of the communion services uh, here at uh, Emmanuel West. And her and Dave, her husband, have both faithfully served a small group. And I say that small group is no longer a small group. It's like a mini congregation. There's probably like 20 or more people in that group. I heard someone uh, else got invited after the service to this small group. Those are, as I said, a blessing to us. And they don't tout themselves. And you often don't realize who those servants are and what they've done unless you intentionally take the time, as I did during this preparation for this sermon, to reflect on the servants you know personally. And you stop and think, man, what have they, these people done for us? Harry McMullen's here. Harry is, is a joke because he, when he emails uh, us, he'll submit your faithful servant because he's a volunteer coach. But he's got a, a servant's heart as well. And if people like that are a blessing in our life. This morning, as we conclude our series on servanthood, we're going to examine from the pages of Scripture what it means to be a servant on the job. Now, I'm going to give you, first of all, three reasons why, if you're going to serve, 
that service must begin at work. One, servanthood must be seen on the job because that's where you spend most of your life. No matter what your job may be, no matter how many places you work, if you work full-time over 40 to 50 years of your life, you're spending a large portion of your life other than at home working. And therefore, it's vital that serving be demonstrated, be visible wherever you work. Second thing, servanthood has to be seen in the job because that's where your faith is most visible. Here in the church, we gather here and we all profess to be followers of Jesus Christ. We all proclaim that we love God. But out there in the world, we're often rubbing shoulders with people who don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior. It's one thing for us to gather here and to say to one another, I'm a servant. But it's an entirely different thing out there in the everyday world in which we live. Here's what Jesus had to say in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. He talked about being a light. And he said, if a light is put on a hill, you don't hide that light. And he goes on in uh, the great, uh, in the, the uh, Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, and he said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So the way that you display your Christian faith is by your attitude and the good deeds that you do outside of this place. How many of you have heard of the organization, the company Service Master? You should, many of you should have heard of that. The founder of that company is a man by the name of Marion Wade, who happens to be an outstanding Christian individual. He was so committed to living out his Christian faith on a daily basis that inside the Service Master headquarters, a huge sign in the wall reads this way, If you don't live it, you don't believe it. You can talk all you want but the proof's in your lifestyle. You can profess, but if you're not actually living it, you don't really possess it. Don't just talk about being a servant. Show it by the way that you do life. Don't simply go about mouthing pious platitudes about serving. Instead, just quietly and humbly go about serving. Third, servanthood must be seen on the job because it's at the workplace that servanthood is most needed. Now, I hope you understand this about the American economy. It is built on capitalism. We're also well aware of this, that capitalism is based on competition. And I want to make it clear to you that capitalism is not inherently evil. Capitalism can be very good and it can be healthy. It can motivate you to do your absolute best. But competition in a fallen world, often becomes downright ugly. It becomes negative. It can become mean-spirited. Let's be honest. We live in a cutthroat world. It's dog-eat-dog. It's survival of the fittest. It's might makes right. Out there in the world, you're told that the way to the top is to look out for number one and to climb as uh, fast as you possibly can Don't be afraid to trample over people on your way up the ladder. And when and if you make it to the top, do all that's necessary to stay there at the top, to remain there. It is a jungle out there. It's difficult. It is often a cold, cruel world. There are few servants out there. And that's exactly why you as a child of God, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's why you need to be a servant because there aren't a lot of them out there. So what does a servant look like in the workplace, in the job market? The answer may surprise you, and we're going to look at it from five verses in Ephesians chapter 6. And when Paul uses the word slave, think of the word, you can substitute the word employee. And when he says master, you can think of the boss or the employer. And notice in these five verses, there are two levels. There's the level, level one of being a slave or a servant. There's also the level of being a master or a boss or an employer or an owner. And that's helpful because most of us in here live at both levels at the same time. Most of us have people that we work for. We have superiors, supervisors, people that are over us to whom we answer or to whom we're accountable. Most of us also have people that are on our same level. They're the co-workers. And most of us 
also have people that, we an- that answer to us. So for most of us in here, the aspects of being a slave and the aspect of being a master should apply to us specifically and individually. What is God's counsel to those who work for a living? And listen to me. If you're a housewife, don't say, I just am a housewife and I don't work. My neighbor had that conversation with me one time. She had three little boys, and she said, I don't work. I'm just a housewife. I said, don't ever say you're just a housewife. Trust me, you're working. And your husband would probably be at that other place of work than home with the kids. So you're working. And this applies to us as students, too, or to us as athletes as well. So what's it look like? In one concise word, Paul says, obey. Look at verse 5. He says, slaves, remember we're using the word servants, obey. There's nothing cloudy, something ambiguous, hard to understand about that. We all know this. We are to obey. When we go to our job, we get instructions about what we are to do. And we are expected to comply. How are we to do that? What does servanthood and obedience look like at the workplace? Let me suggest four ways to do your work as a Christian. First of all, in verse 5, do your work respectfully. Take your job so seriously that you do all that you can to keep, to prevent from doing poor quality of work. So many who profess Jesus Christ as Savior seem perfectly content to take their jobs lightly. I think what a lot of times we do as Christians is we want to compartmentalize our lives. We say that when we come here together, that's sacred, that's, sec- that's uh, special, that's to the Lord. We consecrate it to the Lord. But then we go out and we say the rest of our life is secular. No, all of life is sacred. And all of life is to be done for the Lord. So, The Bible says that when you go to your job, when you call on your client, when you make a sale, when you have a project to complete, do your absolute best. For the Christian, our motto, our mantra should be, no matter what our job is, do good work. That should be the standard for those who name the name of Jesus Christ. It seems like we've lost that standard, that attitude in America. We have lost the idea of doing our very best. And we don't seem to have the Puritan ethic that America was founded on, which means doing our best, working an honest day's work. God, listen, if you're a child of God, He expects you to give 100% every moment that you're at work. In our society, we've lost the idea of workmanship. We've lost the drive for excellence. We've lost the notion that work is a noble pursuit. For God's people, our thinking ought to be this. God is gracious. He's been gracious enough to give me something to do. And I'm going to strive to do it well. I'm going to strive to do it with excellence because God has entrusted this responsibility to me. Being a Christian is no excuse for shoddy work. And I cringe whenever I hear someone say to me, Pastor, you know what? I'm never going to hire another Christian because They take advantage of our faith relationship. That's my brother or sister in Christ, and they've done poor work, or they didn't do it on time, or they didn't do anything that they promised to do, that they committed to do, and I don't want another Christian to come into my house and do any kind of work for me. Then they say, you know what, Pastor, I'd rather hire someone from outside because I know when they're hired, they'll show up, and they'll do a good job. That's an embarrassment to Christianity when a believer would do less than an honest day's work because they think that they can somehow take advantage of their fellow believer. Being a Christian means you strive to do your best. You say, I have a Christian boss, and I can kind of goof off, and he'll look the other way. That's taking advantage of your Christian boss. Do your best. Second, do your work sincerely. Again, in verse 5, has to do with focus. Concentrate on your work. Put aside everything else when you're at work and strive to do your absolute best. Now, how many of us, when we start something at work, we get sidetracked with personal issues or we start fiddling around with something other than what we're paid to do? We get hungry, we get thirsty, and we have to get up and move around. We have to find somebody else to talk to because our attention span is short. If we desire to be a Christian on the job, we need to concentrate on the task that God's given to us. That word sincerity in verse 5 literally means no fooled. 
picture the old Roman robes with its many folds. And when you look closely at that robe, you couldn't see the whole robe in its entirety because it's folded up. Paul is stating for us that when you work, there ought to be no folds in your motivation. No secret agenda, no hidden plans, nothing that's the least bit shaky. If you're going to be a Christian on the job, it should be this. What you see is what you're getting. You should be able to say, boss, trust me, you don't have to worry about me. You don't have to worry about my motivation, about whether I'm going to be loyal, and whether I'm going to perform to the best of my abilities, because I'm a Christian. And as a Christian, being sincere means there's nothing hidden, nothing tricky on the inside. That means this. If you are supposed to show up at 7.30, you show up at 7.30, or how about this? You show up earlier. You don't show up later. You don't come traipsing in 10 to 15 minutes late habitually with some flimsy excuse. I'm not talking about that emergency, something happened, you got a flat tire on the way to work. I'm talking about habitually showing up. It means that if you're going to call on a, you say, I'm going to call on this client, That's exactly what you do. It means if you say, I'm going to stay late after work and finish this, that's what you do. It means if you're given a tough assignment to tackle, that's what you do. You're going to show up on time and do your absolute best. Christians should be the best workers. We should be the highest motivated, most productive workers. Why? Because we're not working for an earthly master. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10.31, whatever you do, do for the glory of God. Some of us, we say, man, I work with lost people. They don't know Jesus, and I'm worried. I'd like to witness to them. I don't know how to do that. You want me, me to tell you the best way to witness to your coworkers? Do good. Do great work. You want me to tell you again? Excellence opens the door for evangelism. Good workmanship, good performance, good determination, perseverance. Those are the things that open the door for us. We've earned the right to tell others about Jesus. Third, look at verse 6. Do your work conscientiously. Another version says, not with eye service. What's eye service? Some of you know what eye service is. That's when you're sitting at your desk and somebody says, quick, get to work, here comes the boss. And so what you do is you clean off your desk and make it look like you've been working for hours and working hard, and you get on the phone, pick up the phone, and pretend you're talking to somebody. You start filing. Or you exit a program or a game on your computer. You do whatever it is you're supposed to be doing. That's eye service. You work hard when you think the boss is watching, and you slack off the moment he leaves your area of work. I remember, and I told him at the early service, I coach now, so I know the tricks. I remember when I was in 7th and 8th grade, we had a coach by the name of Mr. LaPlaca. He was also my English teacher. He was a disciplinarian, and I was scared silly. And I remember sitting by the window, and it was cold. He'd have his window open in the winter, and I'd feel like my armpits were going to have icicles because I was sweating, and I was also nervous. This guy made me nervous. But he coached basketball, and the first day we went in, he got all the 7th graders together. They picked five to play with the 8th graders, and I was fortunate to be one of them. But he, the ninth grader told us, listen, don't, mess, don't jerk him around. He'll kick you out of practice. I'm like, you know, I already have him. I already know who he is. And I was scared. And I went in there, and he goes, if I talk to you, it's yes, sir, no, sir. That's the kind of guy he was. So I got picked to go into uh, a scrimmage early, first day there. He goes, go into left wing for Cormanic. You know where that is? I go, yeah. He goes, sit down. I'm like, didn't say yes, sir. But he was a tough, tough guy. But our ninth grade coach was Mr. Campitelli, who was the principal, and Sometimes he had to do his duties as a principal and he couldn't be at the practice. So Mr. LaPlaca would go up with the older kids. And what did the 7th and 8th graders do at the other end of the gym? Clowning around, messing around. The minute he turned. But Mr. LaPlaca always seemed to know when we were messing around, too. He's like, start running backwards around the gym. Try running around the back. We had to run 50 laps backwards around the gym. And you talk about sore thighs and that. It was so eye service. That's eye service. It's when... You, do your, you have one eye on the clock at work, seeing how, how can I get out of here five or ten minutes early? Or how can I get out for lunch and stay out a little longer? It's trying to cut corners on the job. Paul says we are to work as unto the Lord, not just to please the boss when he's around. So young people, that can be you when you're supposed to be at home studying and you hear your parents coming up the steps or you hear them approaching your room. 
all of a sudden you shut something else off and you pull out your book. That you don't even know what chapter you're in the book because you haven't read it. It's not serving your parents. It's serving the Lord, doing your best. Paul is saying, don't think of yourself as a slave or a servant of man. Think of yourself as a servant of Jesus Christ. Do it because you're doing the will of God. Do it from your heart. Do it because the Lord is watching you and because you in your mind believe that the Lord deserves your very best. Verse 7 says, do your work enthusiastically. Serve wholeheartedly. That's a constant theme through these verses. It's the opposite of working half-hearted or with a lazy attitude. It's the opposite of just plodding along saying, I'm just killing time. I'm just putting in my time till I can retire or I'm just putting in my time till a better job opens up. It's doing it as unto the Lord. And I tell young people all the time, if you are a C student, then, then work your hardest to get a C. If you're an A student, do that A work. Don't say, well, I can just coast along and get... No, do it as unto the Lord. When you step out in the sports venue, do the best you can as unto the Lord. Do it wholeheartedly. Do you have a job? Would you like a promotion? Let me offer you a hint on how to win a promotion. Go to work tomorrow. And do your work with enthusiasm. Throw yourself into that job. And when the people they're looking to promote, the people in the top are looking to promote, now, what are they looking for? They're working for people that are devoted, that are enthusiastic, that are eager to work, that are 100% committed, that are dependable. The world is filled with lazy sluggards and slackers. There's no shortage of those individuals. They're a dime a dozen, which means they're everywhere. They're readily available. Do your work like the Bible says, and somebody will notice. Listen, at least God will notice. And He will reward you in His perfect time, His perfect way. William Barclay said this, It is the conviction of every Christian worker that what he produces must be good enough to show God. So how about it, worker? Is your work pleasing to the Lord? How about it, student? Are you doing the best that you can in your classes? Whatever it is we're doing, it should be viewed as a calling from the Lord. Your workplace, your classroom, your athletic venue is your mission field. It's your ministry. You are called to your job, your position in life, as much as I'm called to be a pastor. Martin Luther, I love what he said. He said this, even a dairymaid can milk cows to the glory of God. You can do whatever it is that you're doing to the glory of God. Verse 8 tells us the reason you do it is because the Lord will reward you. Now, I think the number one problem that many of us face in a sermon on work is that we get discouraged and we say, you know what? Nobody's going to know. Nobody notices where I work. No one's paying attention really to what I do. It's very unsettling to think that your work doesn't matter. Honestly, no one wants a thankless job. Most of us don't expect to be praised for what we do. The three fa uh, phrases that we fear worst, the most, are these. Hey, can I talk to you for a moment? Uh-oh, what do they want to talk about? Would you stay after work? Hey, I need you to stay after class. Hey, I need you to stay after practice. I just need to talk to you for a minute. Right away we're going, uh-oh. They're going to say something about the way I practice today. They're going to say something about my classwork. They're going to say something about the way I do my job. Or if they say to you, you know what, I've been watching you. Uh-oh, they've been watching me. We get this sick feeling. If they've been watching me, obviously we jump to this conclusion they're going to say something that they're unhappy about. They're going to point out my flaws and my faults. Paul wants us to be mindful of this, that God's watching us, not in order to kick us or to crush us, but to reward us. That means that everything that you do on the job, every good piece of work that you produce, it's seen and it will be rewarded because God is no man's debtor. So we talked about the employer, E, the servant. Look at verse 9 and you see the rules for the boss. Two rules. Don't threaten. Don't try to intimidate. Don't try to bully. B, number two, there's no partiality. Those are two things that bosses and parents alike can struggle with. We can make threats. You better do this or else. We can crush dreams. We talked about that last week. We can push and put people down. 
And we can play favorites. And then we wonder why things don't seem to be working out smoothly. Don't employ those tactics because Paul says this. Get this. If you're a boss, an owner, an employer, a parent, there is a master above. There's somebody above you. You say, really? Yeah. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is above you. Just the word of those who either own your own company, or you're the boss, you're self-employed. Think about it. In today's world, what's the bottom line? The bottom line is how much money do you make? What's your profit? How big's your company? How many employees do you have? Where do you rank? How much of that market that you're in do you control? Paul is informing you that if you're an owner, if you're a boss, you're an employer, when you get to heaven, get this. The question God's not going to ask you is, well, how much money did you make? He's not going to say, how many people worked under you? What was your after-tax profit? God's going to ask you, how did you treat people? If you treat people like commodities to be used and disposed, when you stand before the Lord, it's not going to matter that you made a lot of money. Because in that day, your money will be gone. And your empire vanished. The only thing that will be left is the record of how you treated people in this life and how you went about serving the Lord. So let me ask you as we wind it down, ultimately, who are you working for? Who are you speaking for? Who are you as a student studying for? Who are you playing for? Believe me, I'm competitive. I see Coach Roman out there. He's competitive too. And I have to remind myself of this all the time. When on my way up to the practice, Lord, let me be an encouragement to the kids. And Hannah's going to find this out this year that I'm a, I'm a competitor. I don't like to lose. But I also need to lose with grace because there could be a Christian on the other bench praying, Lord, let me win. I don't pray to win because that, I don't know that God cares about winning. He cares about being glorified. And I have to coach, and I sometimes think, I don't want people to think that coach in the other bench is smarter than me. If they look at me, they probably realize that he's smarter than me. But I don't, we, we, we coach for the glory of God. And that's what i got to realize. And every day before a game, I pray, Lord, I pray several things. Lord, set a guard over my mouth and keep watch at the door of my lips. i got to memorize. Harry's sitting there because I write him down, and he sat in the bench beside me, and I write him down, and sometimes Harry's pulling me down. Like, calm down, coach, and, and uh, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord. I, I memorized them. I have them written down in a paper. Problem is, sometimes in the game, that paper's all like this, and it's like, where's those verses I need? Harry was sitting there beside me. He's going to coach somewhere else. I'm going to miss him this year, uh, helping me keep calm. But when I pray, Lord, I want to coach to the glory of God. I want people to come in, and I want the kids that I get the privilege of coaching and say, above all, Coach Streets is a man of God. He loves God. I wouldn't want them to walk in and go, I'm not going to listen to that guy preach. That guy? I just saw him in the gym, and he's a nutcase. You know, I don't want that. Do all you do for the glory of God. So if you're, sell, if you're in sales, who are you selling for? If you're working as a secretary, who are you doing that work for? Who am I preaching for? If we're only working for an earthly master, the Word of God is telling us that we are essentially wasting our lives. When you do a good job, you are serving Jesus Christ as much as a missionary in a faraway land. And conversely, when you cheat your boss and you don't work an honest day, and you do poor or shoddy work, and when you're lazy, when you show up late, when you're disrespectful, when you're not conscientious, when you're insincere and unenthusiastic, you are sinning against God just as much as a criminal out on the street is sinning against God. As I close the series on servants, what we need is an army of servants. God help us that we would step up and echo the words of Jesus who said, I am among you as one who serves. Let us pray. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I want to ask you, first of all, can you say as an individual that you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? He came, He said, to serve and to give His life as a ransom. Has there been that time in your life where you've opened your heart and life to Jesus? I've made it clear many, many times that Christianity is not about what church you attend. Christianity is about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Can you say for sure in your own heart and your mind, I know Jesus as my Savior? If you can say that, thank God for your salvation. But there may be one here today say, Pastor, I don't have that personal relationship you talk. I know about Jesus, but I don't know Him personally. But I'd like to know. I'd like Him to be my Savior. If that's true of you as you sit there this morning, I encourage you to pray a prayer in the quietness of this worship center, just in your own heart to the Lord Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, I admit, I owe up to the fact that I'm a sinner. And I understand that you came to this earth and you went to the cross of Calvary. You had your body nailed. You shed your blood as a covering, a payment for my sin. Lord Jesus, I am sorry for my sin. Would you please forgive me? Would you cleanse me? I'm asking you to come into my life today to be my Savior. And I'm aware that you want me to follow you from this moment on. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, is there one here today you say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today, and I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. Would you slip your hand? I'm not going to point you out in any fashion whatsoever. Is there one here that said, I prayed, I asked Jesus into my life? Perhaps there are those that say, you know what? I'm committing myself to being a servant, a servant in my place of work, a servant in my school, a servant in my community. Would you pray for me that I might earn the right to be heard, that others might see a difference in me? Yes, the way I go about my work. Yes, many hands. Father, I thank you that you've given us the incredible privilege. You've given us instructions on how to be a servant. Lord, help us to take what we've heard and be a servant to our families, to our places of work, and to the body of Christ and those outside of Christ. Thank you, Lord. And I ask you to send us home with your blessing. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day. God bless you.